First, we're just going to start off. I will introduce kind of like the, everyone should go around and introduce themselves. Um, and then really I'll kind of go through our objectives, which are really to start a dialogue about racial diversity and the lack of it within our field of EMS. Um, I'll go a little bit over the article, just really more so that it's not just a St. Paul problem, it's not a Minnesota problem, it's an EMS problem, and there's actual studies showing um, huge underrepresentation within minorities, and even with counting females too, is like the non-white male within EMS. Um, my name is Savannah Hodges, and I'm EMT for St. Paul Fire at Station 51. I'll switch. <laughs> Brittany Baker, I am a firefighter paramedic for St. Paul Fire. John Martinez, firefighter paramedic for St. Paul Fire. I'm Bjorn Peterson, Assistant Medical Director with Regents Hospital EMS. And I'm Jamie Smith, Fire Captain, EMT, St. Paul Fire. I'm Abdi Warsami, St. Paul Fire Paramedic. I'm Aaron Claussen, the EMS Fellow for Regents Hospital EMS. I'm Ulysses Sanchez, St. Paul Firefighter Paramedic. I'm Kayla Sanchez, St. Paul Firefighter Paramedic. Roy Macoso, Deputy Chief, St. Paul Fire. Jody <laughs> Carroll, St. Paul Fire, um, Firefighter. Uh, and I'm Carrie Haley, Assistant Medical Director with Regions EMS. All right, everyone, thank you all for coming and participating in this conversation. As Dr. Peterson kind of alluded to, I think this would be a great, it's just a starting point um, in moving forward in conversations. Uh, with a lot of the recent events within our own state of Minnesota, um, the, there's been a, really a move to create a conversation surrounding diversity um, within our workforce and within our communities. And I thought, you know, working with, since we were able to have the ability to work with you guys with St. Paul um, and to have a little bit more diverse of a workforce in St. Paul, I think this is a great starting point. So again, thank you all. Um, so kind of going off of today, what we'd really like to do is open that conversation. Um, kind of hit on a couple topics here. I'd like to maybe talk about um, the way that racial diversity and the lack thereof um, within EMS to how we're trained, our mentors kind of growing, going up into how we come to where we are today. Um, and then I'd like to really touch on kind of how the lack of diversity really relates to how we are interacting with our patients, perhaps racism we've experienced from our patients or other healthcare providers themselves. We know that diversity is lacking within EMS. There was actually a recent act published study within pre-hospital emergency care that's titled Females and Minority Racial Ethnic Groups Remain Underrepresented in Emergency Medical Service. Um, and they looked at a assessment from 2008 to 2017, excuse me, and they were using the numbers from the new people taking the NREMT um, or the exam to kind of model who's going into the workforce every year. Um, this is not an East Metro study. It's not a Minnesota study. It is a na nationwide study, so it really highlights that this is a national problem. Um, in that, we saw that female EMTs increased from 28 to 38 percent over that 10 years. Um, female paramedics less so, only 21 to 23 percent in that 10-year period. So really only an absolute increase of less than 2 percent over 10 years for females within EMS, which is not a great number. Um, looking at minorities, so they kind of lumped, lumped everyone together as minority, meaning non-white. EMTs did increase from 22 to 27 percent, paramedics from 13 to 19 percent in that 10-year period. But if you break it down into kind of the larger minority representation, so black um, EMTs and paramedics, they didn't increase at all over that 10 years. So it remained about 5% for black EMTs, 3% for black um, paramedics. Hispanic um, did increase a little bit, so 10 to 13% for EMTs, 6 to 10% for paramedics. So really the conclusions were that the new grads entering the workforce, we're not going to change the face of EMS by doing the same things that we've been doing because over the last 10 years, things didn't really change that much. Um, so we need to find new interventions to really bring um, a better representation of the population at large 
into our field of EMS. So I just kind of wanted to kind of open with a little exercise. So I don't know if anyone ever played the game, Never Have I Ever. Normally done with beverages, but we do not have the beverages this time, so uh, maybe later. So if everyone is going to do 10. So if everyone wants to put their 10, their hands up. All righty. So just as an overview, never have I ever, it will be a statement. If that statement is something that you really never ever have experienced, you keep your hand up. If you have experienced that, you put your finger down. So if I say, never have I ever been to a cardiac arrest, you, if you've been to a cardiac arrest, you put that down. If you have not been to a cardiac arrest, you don't put a finger down. Good? Good. <laughs> All right. Never have I ever had a mentor the same race and or gender as me. Never have I ever been the only female and or person of your heritage culture in the room. Never have I ever been fired from a patient who or been refused to be treated by them. Never have I ever been fired with the patient suggesting that the gender was a reason for why they refused to be seen by you. Never have I ever been fired and the patient suggested that the race, your race, was a reason why they refused to be treated by you. Never have I ever been called a racial slur by a patient. Never have I ever been called a racial slur by another healthcare provider. Never have I ever witnessed another healthcare provider make biased, sexist, racist, whatever ist comments as a joke. Never have I ever witnessed another healthcare provider make biased um, comments about a patient. Never have I ever called out another healthcare provider for their comments that are racist, bigotist, however you want to say. All right, how many fingers? I got three. Got one, six, two, four, four. I got seven. <laughs> it's not a game you want to win necessarily. Well, yeah. I don't, it, yeah, it's not a game. It's not a game. No. We got a zero. <laughs> So if you we will, we can look around the room, we can um, look at each other, see who had the fingers, who didn't have the fingers kind of up, and really kind of take a moment to take that in, think about that. Um, what does that mean for our profession and what does that mean for us as individuals? So, um, so does Carrie, anyone I think, yeah, uh, since this have is any comments a, about this? A, a podcast format people may not be able to see. This is true. Um, <laughs> I think Dr. Clausen and I, left with the most fingers up and we're both the two white guys in the room so that's telling mm -hmm. so i think that from this i think that those of us who are not white males in the room right now can really see we can acknowledge that we've been probably confronted with racism um or some other sort of um infliction upon us within our field where we practice um, in some form within our profession. So kind of want to just open it up now for a kind of a discussion. Um, the first couple questions were about mentorship. So talking about, did you have a mentor or if anyone has stories that you're willing to share that would be wonderful about your track and if you had mentors that were your race, your gender, um, and what that meant to you as you were going through your career so far? I can talk about that. I wanna, uh, when I first started EMS, I didn't have a mentor, my race, of my gender, but after I uh, became a, a paramedic and started working at uh, St. Paul Fire, it was a, a eye-opening to see what another person, you know, uh, has experienced, you know, show you and, and, and um, explain to you uh, what it's like to be a paramedic um, and a firefighter. So when I when I first started EMS, I didn't have it, and I kind of 
was struggling with it, you know, trying to figure out um, how to do things and how to um, um, become a good, uh, you know, paramedic. But after I got the job and I was well into the job, is when I got uh, a mentor, and that was good, good for me in yeah. my experience. No, it's great to have mentors that you can relate to. Can you? Would you mind speaking a little bit to? what it was like going through schooling and getting through EMS without having anybody there that was necessarily someone that you could relate to as far as your race. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I went to, um, well, when I first went to e EMS school as an EMT, um, I went with my peers um, and there was diversity in my classroom. But um, when I went out, into the uh, streets to get some experience, there wasn't any diversity. So um, I had to constantly, you know, um, no, you know, try to figure out where I fit in. Um, if I did, what are the norms? You know, what are the cultures like? You know, it was, it was challenging um, when I was um, doing my clinicals. But when I first started, I didn't have experience, but after I got, you know, hired as a firefighter and worked and met other people in the fire department, that's when I actually uh, got a mentor, and it was good for me, you know? Great. So if I could uh, add to that, I think what Abby was trying to say was uh, in the initiative when we started this uh, journey through EMS, mm -hmm. we, we were blessed that we had this program at St. Paul EMS Academy where everybody there for whatever reason or another, we were selected to diversify, right, the program. That was like an initial start. So we were already inherently submerged in a grand or bigger picture mm -hmm. of what the society we're trying to represent in, right? We had blacks, we had Hispanics, we had uh, females, we had everybody across. So right. we supported each other as we went through that very difficult time right. in our uh, lifetime there. Um, but it was, it was a struggle where we could lean on each other from different races and learn from each other. But once we started expanding a little bit more, now we got out of our little safe bubble in mm -hmm. the city, um, it got a lot tougher. You know, we went to the college site mm -hmm. where you don't have as many um, diverse backgrounds to back you up and you don't build those connections. So when you really start to venture out further up in the paramedic program, sure. um, you definitely felt sometimes like you were uh, tested with every single thing you did and it was hard. It was very hard. Do you, when you say that tested, meaning judged or compared to other classmates, or did you did you feel that bias that you know we're talking about? So it's not necessarily the base knowledge of what you're being tested on. Let's say the curriculum itself. You're being tested on all aspects. How how you're um, how you're interacting with certain patients, they might judge you for doing something wrong that you don't know necessarily. A lot harsher that comparison to somebody else, let's say of a white male uh, that did it, oh, they'll just blow it off, it's no big deal. But oh no, Yuli did it, we're gonna make an example of him. Uh, I don't know if Brittany wanted to touch on this, but like when she worked in the hospital, there were certain things that she would tell us and we would share those experiences. Oh yeah, no, that's the same thing, but. We talked to John or whoever, Smith, he did the same exact thing and nobody said anything to him. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so I kind of touched on one of the jobs I have. Obviously, I work with Brady Zemus, um, and I've been the only female, well, African American female on our team for eight years since the inception. Um, and there's been a couple Asians that have come along. But and when I worked in the ER up at Mercy, I was the only female of color that worked in the ER. And there was one male of color that worked in the ER. Um, did not realize just how uh, racist and no comment was until I started working there. Um, and I've been put out of patients' rooms and docs have had to go in and battle and fight for me to let them know, like, no, she's the best tech we have. If you need blood drawn, if you need whatever we need done, she's the best person to do it. I'm not gonna have anybody else come splint your leg except for her, and if you don't want her to do it, by all means you can leave. So I've had that side, but I've also had the side where I've done my job and a patient complained about it, called me multiple racial slurs, put me out of the room, threatened to harm me, 
and then the hospital administration backed everything that that person was saying. Um, and at that point, that's when it quit. Now, if anybody knows me, they know I work a lot of jobs and that it's hard for me to quit jobs. <laughs> um, but I felt like that was my time to go because if I can't feel supported by someone or if I feel threatened, um, natural instinct is for us to, to react to that as human beings. And I did not feel supported at all in being called the N word and being told that not to take it personal. And I look around and I'm like, well, I'm the only person here that can take it personal, so it's hard to not take being called the N word personal or being called a monkey and that being okay for people that I work with. So I would come back to 51s, which has always been my safe haven where I could talk to Yuli, Kayla, or well, Abdi, John. Um, all of our family that we have there and be like, man, like this is what happened. And then you would be like, man, this is what happened when I was working and obvious what happened. And, and to be able to have that um, shared experience, not necessarily as a good thing, but for someone to at least understand where you're coming from so you can let loose and sometimes even cry and say how you feel without being judged on that or saying that they're taking it too personally. You just, you just don't feel like you're alone, basically. Yeah. Uh, you don't you don't have to face those struggles not only to obtain the certifications that you're trying to obtain that's already demanding and stressful as it is but then you throw in the racial mix in there where the they might look at you a little bit different or you're already struggling because you're having a bad day and you've hit five or six critical patients and you just want to talk to somebody and you don't get that same exact support like Brittany was saying where we can come back at 51 amongst ourselves talk about it and really um, really point out the big errors in how people treat each other, especially treat amongst ourselves. We're all healthcare providers, you expect. We all treat each other the same, you know, try to help each other, especially coming up as a new person. So let me ask a question here, and um, some of this is out of my ignorance. And so I'm just, I, I just am curious, you know, Brittany, you talked about how other, like your doctors and other co-workers had to stand up for you. They shouldn't have to do that, but they did it. And, and so for me, when I'm in a situation like that, yeah, I'm gonna stand up for my coworker, but then also part of me feels like even by me doing that is somewhat humiliating. I'm just curious, is it, is it not? I mean, what, what, what's, I guess I'm not asking what should I do, but what are your, you know, when somebody has to do that, is that, does that, Help you, or does that? It, it's a mixed bag, I think. But can I do Is it okay if I comment yeah, on that? Um, I think the best thing that you can do anytime that you witness that type of scenario happen or hear about it is to speak up. Because if you're staying silent on it, you're silently saying that you're okay with it. And sometimes that's difficult and it's uncomfortable to speak up on that because then you are posing yourself. You're, you're putting yourself in a confrontational situation that you were not initially involved in, which is selfless. But in doing that, you are advocating and you're defending the person that's getting discriminated against, which is just not acceptable and it shouldn't happen. So anytime you stay silent, you are sad to say you are saying that you are okay with whatever's being said or done. So it's, I, I personally feel that is the most loving act you can do is to actually speak up, um, even if it has nothing to do with you. If you see somebody being discriminated against for whatever reason, you have to say something. Appreciate it, that makes sense. I had Brittany stand up for me once in class. Uh, I was in paramedic school, and uh, and I, we were, our class was diverse. It was, you mm -hmm. know, firefighters and us EMTs who were trying to become paramedics. And uh, I had an instructor, and uh, he, I, th I think he was a assistant. It wasn't like a, a faculty instructor, but it was an assistant instructor. But he was also a firefighter, but in another city. And he said, you know, I asked him, what is it like for, you know, because I'm Somali and, you know, I want to know what, you know, how many people live in Somali. Somali community live in his service area and if they had any um, providers. Mm -hmm. 
And I was thinking about maybe, you know, if there is a good amount of, you know, Somalis out there, maybe I could be a useful resource, you know, and maybe apply for their department and maybe get hired and maybe be helpful there. But then the instructor went south almost instantly, said, if you guys think you guys can come here and, you know, try to blow shit up and, you know, um, do some, you know, uh, terrorist thing, we will shoot you. I will shoot you. And hmm. me and Brittany, and I think Tiana was also there, we were shocked. Yeah. And, and me, I was shocked personally because I wasn't expecting that from an instructor. You know, and maybe, you know, some a drunk patient or something, you know, somebody's not in their right mind. But from an instructor, that was shocking. So I, it shocked me to the point where I didn't, have a word to say. And I remember Brittany and stepped up and said that, you know, this is not acceptable. And and told the instructor, you know, you're wrong. And also even went further and made a complaint and told the other instructors and and eventually that person wasn't um, teaching in our paramedic course. But because she did that, that person realized, you know, they made a mistake and even came up to me and apologized and said that, you know, he was wrong and and, and, and he was going to learn from that and he was going to change. Mm -hmm. But if she hadn't done that, who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, he would have taken that and be like, yeah, I can, I can say what I want to say and be, you know, that person and get away with anything. Yeah, so. that, and that can be really kind of almost the opposite of what we're talking about, like having a mentor who's able to help guide you through things. When you see your mentors or hear your mentors, people who are supposed to be teaching you or supposed to be helping guide you through your career, actually be very racist or be very sexist or be the opposite of a good example. Um, that's something that I think the stories we need to hear because I don't, if you don't tell those stories, we don't know that this is happening within our field if you don't experience yourself. Um, but it's having an avenue to be able to talk with each other. And I think it's amazing that you guys really were really acting as each other's mentors, really, you know, helping each other through. And, um, and unfortunately, that may be the case just because there is that underrepresentation of anyone within the field um, otherwise, other than kind of your colleagues and yourselves. You know, I, I did want to just piggyback on that, um, on the story that you told um, with, uh, with Brittany addressing what was happening there. And then the question uh, that the doctor asked, you know, as far as uh, is it, I think it was counterproductive or um, is it um, you know, more embarrassing to, to have it brought up and called out? And, you know, I, I just want to say that I think that um, that's exactly what needs to happen in order for the culture to change um, is, of course, uh, stand up for each other, but I think that uh, that backing absolutely needs to come um, from from folks that are outside of um, of whatever group um, uh, is our person is being discriminated against. That's the only way that, uh, as a society and as a culture, we're going to get past it. Is if you know, everybody deems it unacceptable, um, and and furthermore, that that backing means a lot when it's coming from um, you know somebody again who's who's not within that within that group. And kind of to flip it on the on the other side, by saying nothing, I think somebody said that by saying nothing, you're saying that it's okay. Um, you're, you're condoning it. Your actions are condoning it by doing nothing. Um, what I will say about mentorship is that uh, you know, through the creation of Pathways programs uh, with the St. Paul Fire Department, and um, you know, um, Jamie and I's involvement in training and our Equity Change Team, uh, mentorship has been one of the top issues that we've been working on. And it's difficult because um, we don't want to script something that might come naturally. And so um, partnering people up just because they maybe look the same or they're the same gender, um, they might have different skill sets or different interests. Uh, so it, it is a somewhat of a balancing act. Um, I've always been fortunate enough to be, um, you know, a larger male figure. So when I go places, you know, it's, or I interact with folks, usually there, there's a genuine amount of respect. Um, 
I've witnessed others, um, smaller stature, different, um, uh, female, uh, almost have to enter workplaces and feel that every day that they go to work, they have to prove themselves, right? Because I don't want to let, you know, um, gain a bad reputation or I don't want to let the women of color down on this job or I don't want to misrepresent Asian males, right? So it's much more than just the individual performance. It's, you know, it's like the weight of a, a gender or a race uh, on top of that. And to some of the earlier comments, um, Jamie hit it on the head when he was talking about people standing up and really, you know, allies and advocacy is what um, everyone needs, so. Yeah, no, I think that that's huge. And I think you really had a really great point there as far as um, that balancing act and keeping things natural as much as possible, but still providing that background and that backbone for people who may not have others who have gone through similar life experiences in terms of their sex or their the color of their skin um, to bring them forward into their career, really, in their profession. Um, I think so. I think that this has been a, a really great discussion so far, as far as like mentorship and everything. I'd like to maybe delve into a little bit more um, personal experiences that may or may not be uncomfortable to talk about. Um, as far as how you've interacted with patients. I thought one huge thing in this paper was really that not only are there low numbers of minorities and females in EMS, but it's low in proportion to what society is as well. So yes, Hispanic, Asian, Black, we are my, they are minorities within the population of the United States of America, but they are an even sig more significant minority, more underrepresented than the general population within our field. So I would imagine um, that a lot of you may have experienced what kind of the consequence of that. So people are really not used to having a Hispanic woman or a black female or a black male come to their house and administer health care to them because you are even an even smaller portion of society than they are than is normal for them to be seeing. So if anyone would be willing to share stories and how the the lack of diversity within EMS has affected um, how patients treat you or how you feel viewed by the patients, um, I think that would be a really, really powerful s stories to be heard. Well, I can speak to that. Um, I just came off shift this morning, and um, uh, actually this morning, early this morning, we had a patient, and um, she was an older woman, older Asian lady, and I went to give her a hand to get her off the gurney, and she pulled her hand away from me. She didn't want me to touch her. And I've also had that happen um, with an older white woman um, and then you made a comment before, uh, earlier about, um, someone of the same race, um, not wanting or refusing my help. Um, I had an older black woman tell me that she didn't want me, she didn't, I guess, trust me to help to lift her or whatnot. And, um, little did she know I was probably a little half stronger than the guy that she chose <laughs> to help, but she didn't want me to help because of that. So I've had it happen repeatedly. Those are just three like that happened last night for me, so. You, you know, I, I've had um, you know, several instances um, uh, with uh, patients, um, you know, being called uh, racial slurs, um, even to the to the point where I have um, had been asked to and had to leave uh, the residence uh, because I was not welcomed there and they did not want service uh, or my assistance in that house. Um, you know, back of an ambulance. Um, you know, same thing where right? I have had to remove myself from patient care um, due to the the patient's wishes. Uh, but what what I will say is in, in every one of those instances. Um, on this on this job uh, in my department, uh, my in those instances where all white coworkers uh, absolutely stuck up and um, addressed the patient 
um, condone the action and let them know that that's, um, you know, either that, that those comments, that language um, is not going to be tolerated. Um, and I, you know, I certainly appreciated it. Um, it didn't feel good. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, definitely didn't feel good. We all, we all signed up and, you know, we're in this, this field to, to help. And, um, you know, when somebody tells you that they don't want your help just based off of, you know, your, your, your race um, or your gender um, is, is definitely disheartening. But um, I, I, I did su uh, appreciate the support that I got from, uh, from the coworkers. You know, Dr. Peterson, that might have been uh, what you were talking about earlier in that situation that Jimmy just commented and said it didn't feel good afterwards, but he was stuck up for it. Uh, but still, even leaving that, you know, Jamie, I've been in a situation personally that way where I still kind of feel separated from the group even after being stuck. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see what you mean by um, would that be humiliating, but still it's a good thing to hear that the crew stuck up for you in that case, Jamie. Um, just that, not to take away from uh, some of the scenarios uh, that just been brought up what Jamie's been through, but some of the good things that I have seen uh, being a person of color is uh, I'm currently working in Frogtown. Uh, we go into a lot of black homes, uh, black communities, and a lot of kids will come up, start asking questions. You know, I don't know if that's because they see a black man in uniform, which is less common, um, or, you know, I don't know why, but I'm getting questions. Some of the kids come up and get hugged, so I think that's. Uh, that's one of the good things. That's that's a positive thing. Um, so I just wanted to bring that in as well. I was gonna speak on that with John. Like you come to some people's house and they're like, "Oh my gosh, you got a unicorn!" Like it, it's it's something beautiful for them, mm -hmm. especially for like the neighborhood that John works in, that Jamie used to work in. Like that's where I grew up. Um, and so going places where like, you know, and Kayla will tell you like, we go places, she's like, I can't take you anywhere, you know everybody. <laughs> and so when you go into some of the older people that have been in the community for a long time, they're like, oh my gosh, you're such and such a baby. I'm so glad to see you here. Cause last time they came, they weren't so nice to us. And I think that even when you do have coworkers that may or may not stick up for you or that may have their own biased opinions against people of color, that kind of, I think would deter them from making comments or doing certain things that they would do the fact that just your presence and being there um, so that I think also helps the people in the community and then you know to speak on the uh, things that I've learned like being at 51 where we did language learning for a while Bobby tried to teach me some hours and don't work. <laughs> <laughs> but you know like us like trying to spend time like you always try to teach me Spanish and then like learning mom like even when you even if this you know just like a couple words going to somebody's house and being able to use that and I call these in and I'm like oh my gosh like what you told me like work and like the patients even you know like Jody said she has an Asian female that didn't want her to touch her and I've had that happen too but then I've also gone to some homes and spoke a little bit of mom that I know and then just kind of brightens up their faces or they're like gosh like I can't I don't know enough to have a conversation but I know enough to say hello and introduce myself and make them feel a little bit, a little bit more comfortable so I think that sometimes you deal with even Hispanic or um, Asian community people where us being African-American come in and they're like happy even to see someone of color yeah absolutely and um, I think Brittany speaking to the positivity of diversity in that you know on rare occasions where we would have, you know, predominantly um, a crew that was predominantly people of color um, showing up on some runs or just going to the grocery store. I mean, it was, it's, it's like, a, it's almost like a, a one truck parade, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And then even uh, just showing up at somebody's home and uh, instantly, you know, there's trust, right? Whether it's the ability to speak a language or um, having a woman on the crew right and then there's this kid that's injured and there's three giant men or you know this woman that is on a knee like trying to inquire as to what hurts I mean these are um, I mean diversity is essentially different tools in the toolbox and um, you know 50% of our 51% of our clientele are female so um, it, it just it just makes sense it just makes sense yeah and it 
striving towards that better representation within our field, I think really will help because our population is diverse yep. and we are not as diverse as that and getting to, at least towards that, I think is a huge step to at least being able to relate within our communities and really better serve the people that we are entrusted with their, with their health care. Also, can I say that um, us providers, we wear uniform and a lot of the uh, communities that are coming in, uh, living in our cities uh, had, you know, in, in their past have had uh, uh, stories or, you know, um, uh, bad experiences in mm -hmm. their home country with people in uniform. So when they get to see you out of uniform, um, that also brings them, you know, they can feel that they can relate to you. They feel um, proud that, you know, you're representing them. Um, I, when, I, um, when I work in uniform, they get to see me. And then when they get to see me uh, in the community at the mosque or at the, you know, um, and they can even talk to me more and, you know, now I will have more trust in that uniform versus before. Mm -hmm. They didn't know you know, uh, you know, if they could trust you or not. So that's a, that's a huge plus. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to um, uh, add to what, uh, what Chief Mikosa was saying as far as, uh, you know, the parade and the admiration. Um, so I worked on his crew and um, three out of the four, three out of the four crew members were African-American on that crew as a set crew. And, um, and we were working in uh, the Rondo neighborhood and, you know, it, it was like a parade or we would sit outside and, uh, I mean, it was car after car would honk, people would clap, people would, you know, high five, uh, people would yell, yell out, you know, positivity and cheers to us. Um, it was kind of like being a celebrity. <laughs> Actually, it was, but but you know, I say that to say that it is definitely appreciated. Um, you know, serving a community and uh, uh, the community appreciates being served by those that reflect uh, that community. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll bring this up just because you know. Um, but I mean, we work in public safety, mm -hmm. right? As fire and EMS. And um, since the murder of George Floyd, there has been um, a loss in trust in regards to public safety. And that has spread to fire and has also encompassed EMS. So, um, you know, regaining that trust doesn't happen overnight, but having uh, members that reflect the community um, definitely helps. So, Chief, um, you, you, you brought up the George Floyd situation. It, it feels, again, I'm an outsider in all of this, but it feels like there's something different this time than with Philando Castile. With, um, you know, there's been a, a rash, unfortunately, recently, Ahmaud Arbery and uh, Richard and some of those guys. But does it feel different to you this time? Does it feel like there's more people talking or, or willingness to discuss it? Or, or does this just feel like what happens after these incidents um, where we talk about it and then it's all talk, you know? And that's what we want to do here though, is not, not just let it be all talk. We want to, we want to explore this and figure out what, what, what's, what's the culture that we're creating and you in leadership in, in the St. Paul Fire Department, me in leadership here at Regions EMS, um, what, what, I don't know, you know, what, not looking for answers right now, we just want to start a conversation, but, but again, it feels different this time to me as an outsider. Does it feel that to you? Uh, I'll tell you that I hope it's different. Um, I think Jamie and I have recently had this conversation um, in that, you know, um, it's incredibly upsetting that it, it, this has happened in the Twin Cities, right? And it sparked national and international worldwide um, outrage. And this is the second time in four years. So um, I remember being at Station 18 you know, after the shooting death of Philando Castillo and um, just seeing CNN and, you know, all the major news networks, national news networks showing the protest in 94 and, um, you know, the state patrol and the, the protesters clashing and just seeing the, all the helicopters and responding on runs and watching stuff from the roof and just being like, wow. And, um, you know, four years later, I mean, we're, we're doing it again, but even 
you know, on a much larger scale. So um, I do hope that there is change, um, and I do hope that more people um, are their eyes are open as to what the issues are. I mean, if something like that can happen in broad daylight um, with people with cell phones out and body cameras rolling, you know, what happens at three, four o'clock in the morning um, when there isn't that presence, so. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think you know, part of my question too is, I'm an outsider here, so I, I, I admit, you know, Philando Castile happens, it's a tragedy, obviously, but it's not, as personal for me, just because I'm white and I haven't lived this life of discrimination and experiences that you guys are describing here. And I don't know, for me, this one feels different, whether it's just the, the context or the, the situation that, that developed, but I wasn't, I don't feel like I was paying attention before, you know, even after Philando Castillo or after some of these other situations. And so that's where I'm coming from. I mean, does, it feels different to me, but is it because I'm, just because I'm paying attention this time, does it feel different to you guys who, who live this? Um, it, so know. for me, it's, um, it's, and I think for, I can speak for most of us of color, it's always real for us. But all too often, uh, the media, the news, um, they allow whatever they hear after, because it's usually, anytime you see it, you hear all the negative things that that person has done, kind of dehumanizes them. And I think the international outrage and, and uproar um, of people tired of being silent, that um, it has allowed him to continue to be viewed as a human being. And just us in general as being viewed as human beings. Um, I don't know if that's obviously his personal opinion, but that's what it has felt like for me is that every other time, because you know there's a list of names, I don't know if you guys have been over there, and there's like a block, just one block blocked off of names written down. That's not even a quarter, let alone like a maybe even a fifth or of the names of people that have actually been who that have died the same way. And even as I look at it, um, I had the conversation, and the people who know me are close to me. I had this kind of same conversation with uh, my brother's girlfriend. She just graduated from college, and her dad died not too far away from where George was killed but his name is never even mentioned. So this, it is realer for everybody else. Um, it's always been real for us, but the fact that people cannot dehumanize him the way that they have wanted to is I think, the reason why it's so much more different. But that's just... I, 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 would, I would agree. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that it's different or anything has necessarily changed. I think what's changed is the fact that um, uh, things are being recorded. <laughs> things, <laughs> things are being recorded now and um, uh, they're being publicized. Um, we're able to draw more attention to these uh, issues through uh, social media and the proliferation of, uh, of use of social media. Um, so not only locally in the state, uh, in the nation, but worldwide, people are able to see that these things are happening. It's not that they're happening at any greater frequency now. It's just that they're being seen um, at a, at, on a much larger scale now. Uh, I think that's that's the big thing. People in, you know that are un underserved or um, um, you know have been discriminated against or whatever the case may be now have a, a platform and a voice. Whereas in the past, these things maybe weren't publicized or they, they weren't drawn attention to or they were swept under the rug or, or they were, um, um, uh, you know, um, the, the person was uh, dehumanized or, or something to, to that effect to make it, oh, well, that person was this or they had this or, you know, they had this record. You know, in us in, in service and healthcare, it doesn't matter. Right? It doesn't matter. We have a job to do, and we're supposed to do our job to the best of our ability, no matter who that person is. Um, so I think that's that's the big difference. As far as um, I think the other point, uh, question that you had was uh, getting people to the table and people involved in the conversation. I do feel like from that standpoint, um, that has changed. Um, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, it took for a large um, kind of you know sh rattling of the cage, um, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, to get. Uh, more widespread attention 
and, and to get more people to the table uh, to engage in the conversation. Uh, I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good start. Uh, however, if we don't, um, all of us collectively uh, enact um, in turn, intentional um, and um, uh, lasting change, policy change, uh, unfortunately, we're, more, we're, we're set up to be right back in the same position. Yeah, and I don't want to get off track on this either. You know, I don't even know if it's policy change. You know, does that does that even help? It, it's it's a, more of a culture within us, within each of us, that has to that you can't policize out of someone. You know what I mean? Um, it's like right now the the NASCAR you know fiasco thing with the, the Confederate flag and people saying it's just an expression of of Southern style or culture or whatever. Well. Maybe to them, but that's obviously not the case for everybody, and and you can't just make a policy about that because that's what they try to do, and it's not you know, that's not going to change it. There's there's a deeper issue at at the end there that needs to change. That's that's the tough part. Is I don't know you know we're talking about changing the entire nation or the entire world, and, and I think we just have to start with our community first, um, and and just let it spread from there. But, so I'd well, like to. Um, address what you asked is it the same for us um, and how it feels different for you it's absolutely the same for me every single time it happens um, I feel the same way um, I hear the same things the microaggressions start coming out the more time goes away from it um, and things go back to the norm and the way they were and so when you say you feel it a little more I think it's probably because things are getting burned up and torn down now and that didn't happen in our lifetime, you know, um, the way that it's happening now. So one of the things that I think could help alleviate the situation is just um, humanizing black people, period. Um, I can say for certain that I know absolutely probably everything there is to know about white culture. And yet, white people don't know very little about us. How can that be? We've gone to the same schools. We've all grown up side by side. I'm sure you've had black people in institutions you've been in your entire life. Um, how is that even possible to not know simple things about our hair or how we may feel? We feel the same exact way a white person would feel if it was their brother, uncle, cousin, father, son. Um, but because of history, it just keeps repeating itself. So, yes, it's policy, but it's more on a human level. Uh, if you see something wrong, you need to speak up and say something, especially people in positions of power. Um, and that's where the change is going to come, more so. Can I just add too, as a white woman, I'm fortunate enough, um, some of my closest friends are in this room, so I'm surrounded by people of color and I can have some conversations, but being white, I don't have the experiences that a lot of people in this room have. So having those awkward conversations or those conversations that might not be comfortable for you because you're asking questions because you don't understand, just being comfortable with being able to say, I don't understand this, can you explain this more to me? Or what are your thoughts on this? It's huge because we need to open up the conversation to be able to, we'll never understand 100%, but to not even take the time to try or understand where people are coming from and just, I mean, we're in the social media age where there's a there's a reason for everything, right? So, um, you know, this is why this happened and this is why this happened and there's both sides of it and we can go online and just pick whatever our, well, we think, oh, this makes me feel comfortable here, so I'm going to pick this. So just taking the time and actually having those conversations with people I think is huge. Yeah. So uh, just to add on to what Jody said, I'm probably the least experienced in being active or um, just speaking out on these issues. I think for a while I've kind of kept quiet. Um, the George Floyd, for me, was a turning point. Um, personally think I see some more change going on and I have a question for Jamie and following but um, so my wife 
actually thought that uh, George Floyd was her dad. She, she watched the video on social media and she called me crying because her dad, he's a tall black man, lean, lives in Minneapolis, sounded just like him. And she called me crying hysterical because she thought that was her dad. And I had already talked about it at the table during shift change and, you know, shaking my head. And, but when she called me, that, it, that, that hit deeper for me. And um, it was enough for me to understand that I can't be quiet anymore. And it's unfortunate that it took me so long to understand that, but I am grateful that I am here now and I have a little bit more understanding about that. Um, but for me, it was a turning point because uh, it became personal when my wife thought that that was her dad because uh, things would be much different in our home if it was. And at this point now, it is different. Um, there was that shooting, there was those shootings in Minneapolis that happened. Uh, one of the, the, there was a kid, he was young and he actually we went to high school with him. And I didn't know him personally, but unfortunately he died from the shootings. He had children. I'm a father and this was the day before Father's Day. So his kids had to wake up knowing uh, or learning that his dad, their dad died. Uh, you know, you see the picture, he, he's a young black man, dresses a certain way, has certain pictures on his page, but the fact of the matter is, there are children below the age of five that had to wake up that morning. There's a mother that had to explain to them that their dad is, has died. And I can't even fathom my own children having to hear that and them having to understand that. So now it is personal every time that one of these killings do happen. And I do understand now that I do have to speak up on it. And I'm thankful that I'm here today with that understanding. Um, Jamie's somebody that is, for me personally, I knew he was active in Firefighters United, which is uh, uh, Black Firefighters Association for St. Paul Fire. Uh, as long as I've been on, I've known that James participated in that. So my question to you, Jamie, is do you see, to add on to Dr. Peterson's question, do you, moving through the pool as a captain, do you feel, do you see, do you, are you having the conversations that are different now from the past, for as long as you've been on, do you feel like these conversations have changed? Do you feel like there are more genuine conversations happening as you're moving through the pool? I feel like I'm sheltered at Station 18. As you know, it's a good culture in that station. We can have those conversations, but in the pool, do you see change? Uh, good question. So, I think I do notice um, a little bit of shift in the tide. Um, if I compare somewhat apples to apples, uh, I was on the on the job and uh, going through with um, uh, the Philando Castillo uh, murder, and, and now this. And I do feel that there is a little bit of a shift in the tide. Um, however, there's, there's a very long way to go. Um, uh, there, there's still, um, you know, I would say it's, it's, it's noticeable, the, the shift in, 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 I would say, positivity on the issue, acceptance, people coming to the table, looking for um, uh, information, looking for uh, ways to help, uh, looking for explanations, um, you know, and so forth. Uh, but, you know, th there's also um, uh, some that, that aren't willing to come to the table and be a part of the solution uh, as well. So um, to answer your question, I, I, would, I would have to say yes, uh, but still a, long, a very long way to go. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. As far as it being different, um, I'll just, just comment on uh, what Dr. Peterson had said. But um, I think for people of color, uh, like Jody said, it's, it's the same. But for people who are not of color, right, I, I see more involvement. Um, and it's, it's always one of those interesting things because uh, you can kind of see the dynamics in a room change sometimes when a person of color walks in or uh, a woman walks in, right? And so um, there are conversations that are had when people of color are not in the room. And there are conversations that are had when women are not in the room. And going back to that allyship and advocacy, right? Um, you know, what can you do in situations where there isn't a person of color in the room or there isn't a woman in the room 
and something that is said is racist or misogynistic, um, that's an opportunity to say something, right? Because again, going back to not saying something is like the same as condoning it. So that's where I do feel it is different. It isn't just black people out in the streets. It's people of all genders and all races. Well, thank you everybody for sharing those very personal experiences and stories. I think that really it's part of, part of moving forward is learning. And unfortunately that puts a lot on your shoulders to be sharing the stories. Um, but I think that your willingness to do so really will help other people learn, hopefully learn from them and come up with um, a good actionable thing that they can do to make it so that um, they are also then learning and also teaching and not taking some of that burden away from people of color who are being asked to tell their stories and asked to give recommendations. And as we learn, as people, um, as white people are learning, um, if they are able to help move that forward, I think would be a great huge step. Um, we're kind of probably wrapping up around time now. So I just wanted to kind of close with one thought as far as our, since, you know, Dr. Peterson, myself, we're your medical directors. And really as medical directors, a lot of the things we do is, you know, the patient-based things. But I think a huge portion of our patient care is our knowledge about racial diversity and disparities in healthcare when it comes to race. And I'd like to hear from you, maybe you can, if you can't think of anything now, um, maybe shoot me an email or shoot Dr. Peterson an email, let us know in the future. Or maybe this can be another topic in the future, but what can, what, can, what can medical direction do to help with the disparities in um, EMS? And then also further kind of the help with alleviating some of that disparities within our healthcare system. Um, I would say just make sure that when you guys are working in the ER, like I've said, I see you all the time. You're usually, you know, in the in Wisconsin, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do see, a, you know, if you're taking care of a person of color, um, make sure that you're treating them the same way that you would treat a patient who's not a person of color, because you even have that where if some if someone and I've seen it before in ERs where uh, you know African American person will come in or even an Asian person or a Hispanic person that doesn't speak English, and they'll come in and that's all, oh, that person knows their back is hurting, their back is really hurting for a reason, you know, they have a kidney infection, they may have whatever, and they're like, well, they just want pain meds, so, you know, we're just gonna, you know, sit on them for a little bit, and then we'll discharge them. And, but it's not the same thing that they would do, there would be multiple scans done, they'd be doing other things to take care of this person. So if you can just just continue to make sure I've seen and worked with both of you guys for years, just make sure that you when you have that opportunity that you're doing all that you can. And if you see people that aren't doing that, just remind them, okay, number one, this is your job. I didn't like and I I tell people all the time when they get upset about having to take care of patients, I didn't tell you to go to school for this. This was a choice you made. You knew this choice when you got into it, that you're gonna have to take care of people of other colors, so continue to do that and do it in a manner that you recognize that at the end of the day, this person pays your bills. If you, if you can look at it no other way, if you feel like you can't respect anybody for anything else, just remind them that they pay their bills. Um, and that's that's a hard thing to, to say to people, but you guys know me, I'm really open and how I feel. So if you just continue doing what you guys are doing, but stepping up if you see people not doing what they should do. Right, I say um, people need to be, in positions of um, being a higher up, hold people to the standards that are set. Make sure that it's enforced and not let go. Um, let people get away with certain things. And then I think that'll help the culture change as well because they know it's not accepted there. We all have our own opinions and ideas of the way life is. Uh, we all live our lives the way we live them, but when we're in a workplace um, setting, we all need to um, follow the protocols. And so enforcing that um, culture of equality is gonna go far. I don't, I don't, I don't oh, sorry, <laughs> stumbling over here. I'd like to also add um, as being part of the uh, immigrant community and being um, 
a non-U.S. citizen. That's where my journey started. I immigrated here. Uh, one of my biggest things that I noticed was the lack of information going across to these communities, especially like the Hispanic community that is fearful, uh, that population that is quite large. Uh, we, we just don't have the right numbers on how many illegal immigrants are there, especially being a, a state that's a safe haven. So really over communicating and talking to these uh, patients in their own language or really explaining to them their laws or their rights uh, within the laws really goes far. That was one of the biggest leaps I took starting my journey to become a paramedic. And if nobody told me anything, I kind of just jumped in blindly. And little by little, I found out that um, everything I've known really could have been, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? There's really big gaps that I shouldn't have had to gone through alone and struggle through if somebody could have just said, hey, this is an option for you. Hey, you can provide for your family. Hey, this is out there for you. This is safe. Uh, you're not going to be uh, reported to ICE. You're not going to be uh, fearful that your whole entire family is going to get uprooted and shipped back. So over communicating and reaching out to that uh, community that's really in the shadows and quiet because they can't say anything uh, is huge. And I would, uh, I, in the good, good point, um, uh, Yuli, uh, I would say uh, there, there's really three ways that uh, medical directors uh, can help um, and engage in this conversation and help make change. Um, one is, is, is as far as, as, as far as patient care, um, you just be intentional about providing equitable care. Um, maybe go out of your way uh, to provide uh, great care, great service. Um, extra bed, bedside manner, um, just being sensitive to the fact that uh, there are uh, races and cultures that um, have intentionally been inequitable as far as their, recip their, their receipt, um, their access uh, to health care. Um, if we go back to Tuskegee and, and experiments on black slaves and even now the, the, the access to health care um, within the um, uh, diverse communities today is, is, um, has not been uh, at all equitable. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is um, uh, be intentional as far as um, uh, uh, mentorship. So if you do see somebody that is in an underrepresented group, um, and be intentional to reach out to that person, uh, offer uh, some mentorship, offer some encouragement. Um, you know, you might feel like you don't have anything in common with that person, but um, by you being in a position of power, uh, but you intentionally uh, reaching out and tapping that person and, you know, uh, bringing them up, giving them mentorship uh, goes a long way. And that's that's an intentional uh, step to to helping to to bridge the gap and and um, um, and cure some of the inequities that we have going on. Yep. Uh, and also, when I uh, when I go to my community, they don't know medical directors. They don't understand what medical directors do. So it'd be nice to, I mean, if you guys are free or if you guys do any events to uh, maybe come to mosque, or come to the parade or come to a festival, you know, and, and meet the people and learn the people. Maybe um, you guys can learn something from the community and the community can learn something from you guys too. So uh, that's what I would uh, add to that. Boy, that's a that's a great um, idea, Abdi. You know, uh, opportunities to engage in um, you know uh, community relations uh, and engage with uh, the community. So, a um, couple other things. I mean, I think Jamie brought up a really good point. Uh, I think just just the history of uh, systemic racism within uh, healthcare and uh, the fact that Medicare. Uh, was the catalyst for change for hospitals in regards to desegregation, and that was prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So just, I mean, there is a huge tie between health services and EMS and um, hospital care and systemic racism. And just, you know, looking back at that history and acknowledging some of that and just looking at numbers. Um, I mean, the study has got some great numbers, and yeah. I, I pulled numbers uh, for us of our 450 members, 170 are paramedics. Uh, of that, 23 are people of color. So 22.4% are either people of color or women. 
Uh, so that's actually lower percentages than mm -hmm. um, the, the study showed. So, I mean, knowing those numbers allows us to know where we are now. And, you know, if, as long as we know that, we know where we want to go um, and we can track improvements. Um, but just knowing where we are now is, is, is a huge step. And the last thing I'd kind of say is um, uh, six people in this room are a product of our Pathways program. So um, investing time um, or creating Pathways program or leaps from paramedic to nursing or whatever it might be to encourage people of color and women to um, enter in this career field. Uh, just a comment about that too. I mean, I, I, I'm, I still consider myself young, but I've been around long enough to, you know, to see you guys go through the, the um, EMS Academy and Opti. I remember yeah. you and Brittany, you know, and, um, and you, you know, all of you guys I've seen for years and, and just to see how that has made you into who you are too, just the, the confidence. I mean, I, not to embarrass anyone or anything, but just, I remember some of the wide eyed, you know, the, the first few <laughs> times you were at the hospital and, and now to hear you guys talk and share your experiences and see you out on the street and just the confidence when you're bringing a patient in your bedside manners, you know, it's a, I think it's been a hugely successful program for St. Paul. And, um, you know, the fruit is right here in the room for sure. So congratulations to you guys for, Yes, absolutely. Getting and, and getting through that. Absolutely, and, it, and it's to our benefit. I mean, uh, Kayla and Brittany have been running how many uh, EMS academies now? Yeah. Right? <laughs> These wide-eyed folks are now mentors to hundreds of folks that have come through this program, and um, that's just outstanding. So they're more than paying it back. I just I wanted to add on to that we should keep having the conversations um, for medical direction, um, everyone, I think I've been doing my best and I'm going to keep doing my best to speak out on how I'm feeling about certain issues, issues that I feel matter. Um, I called Jamie and Brittany after those shootings in Minneapolis, just to say, uh, how I was feeling about, you know, some children losing their dad. And I also asked like, is there anything we're doing as a, uh, as firefighters united, um, and that's unrelated, but just being able to have that conversation with uh, black peers. And then at the station, I actually, I also had the same conversation with white peers. And I told them how I was feeling. And, uh, you know, we had that conversation. And I'm getting asked questions, you know, as a black man, uh, how do I feel about this? And I think that's what needs to happen. I think if, if, if you're opposite from another, if you're a black female, white female, um, Asian, white, black, it does, you know, anyone, I think, should have a conversation with the opposite. Um, and just being bold enough and doing that with love to ask that person, has this had an effect on you? How do you feel about this matter? Um, and sometimes that's uncomfortable, but I think that's what is most important, like what we're doing here today, is just having a conversation. I think that's that's the start, and it's it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. I've been told that, and I believe that to be true, and I think we just need to keep having the conversations. Yeah, I'd love for us to be able to sit down again, you know, have this not just be a one-time thing. This is not a one-offer. Let's keep a conversation going. Let's pick topics that are hard to talk about or uncomfortable to talk about and really be able to learn from each other and um, help us as in leadership too learn how to grow and learn how what other ways that we can uh, make a difference beyond just, you know, making a guideline or going through credentialing or being there as a, um, a, a person, um, how we can really get involved um, with some really important causes. So, uh, Doctor, um, you know, I would uh, like to take this opportunity to um, allow Ms. Hodges to share her experiences with us. Uh, I understand that she just uh, completed a weekend <laughs> up north in a Fire 1 and Fire 2 training. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and I think that she wanted to share what her experiences were in that, uh, in that training. So with everything going on, I'm going to be really honest. I have not been on long enough to share any experiences that everyone else has. So that's part of difficult for me to engage in that conversation. But um, I, so I'm a new EMT, want to be able to help the community. Going back to also you saying, you know, help me help. 
like everyone said, it is really helpful when I personally feel white males say what, you know, try to um, give their opinions. And whenever they say something, I feel like, like people will hear you more because you're a white male, you know? So, and also going on with like fire one and fire two, I have, I took the test for St. Paul fire when I was 18 years old and I'm still trying to get on today. And I try to do my best to engage in anything with the community. And uh, it was a tough weekend for me, so I'm a little still recovering from that today, so I apologize. And um, with the, um, what, what happened with George Floyd, I grew up in the suburbs, so I was really out of it. I didn't really pay much attention to Black Lives Matter movement. Um, since I moved to St. Paul, it has now, um, made more sense to me and I've opened my eyes a lot more. I'm also a part, um, just newly a part of Firefighters United and I'm also a baby, so it's all new to me, you know, being more open about race and things like that because me, I also struggled growing up with who am I supposed to be? So I'm still trying to figure out where I'm supposed, like where my role is also. Thank you so much for sharing. I think it's, I think it's really good to hear everybody's story. All right, well, I think we're coming, like I said, kind of coming up in time. Again, I thank every single one of you for coming and participating and sharing. Um, I hope that we can continue moving forward and doing this again and coming up with good conversation topics and really trying to come up with even some actionable things that we can all do together and work together to um, really help our field become more diverse. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh.